Guys, welcome back. We are here at SOMCOM 2024 with Mr. Eric Siegelbaum. How are you doing, man? I am great. How are you? I'm doing really well. Awesome. Uh, Eric Siegelbaum, advanced sommelier and owner of sommelier. Yep. What else do you do these days? Uh, uh, basically everything about working in restaurants anymore. So <laughs> sommelier is consulting, education, events, journalism. Um, then I have Good Somme, which is a luxury lifestyle wine club. Mm -hmm. um, Swig Partners, Strategic Wholesale Import Growth Partners. We help alcoholic brands find distributors or importers in any and all 50 states. Um, I'm just launching an RTD cocktail brand called Certo, uh, coming Q1. So oh, nice. Negronis and espresso martinis made in Italy on the Amalfi Coast, all natural, full strength, properly ratio, what? no garbage, not too sweet. Um, and I am the vice president of the United Sommeliers Foundation. Yes, so, dude, congr you guys so much going on. Congratulations. Yeah. Uh, we talked about, I mean, we did an interview, I think eight years, no, six years ago, maybe 2018, I think, it was pre-COVID for sure. Mm -hmm. You've always been a wealth of knowledge. I know you're a Con amongst all those other things that you just mentioned, you're a regular contributor to the Psalm Journal magazine. Every month you're writing articles for them. You have so much insights to offer into the industry. And we need to do a round two on what we did that one time in a full length podcast because there's a ton of value. There's so many valuable clips from that one podcast that I still <laughs> send to people. Oh, when we're talking about how to organize your wine list, uh, your, you know, the price steppers that you were talking about, just so many different things that were so impactful. Also, the way that you do staff education, it was just. There were so many good clips from that. We have to revisit that further at one point. Whenever you're ready, I mean. But we are here in San Diego at SOMCOM 2024, so let's focus on that. So there's, out of the three seminars that you're doing, there's a couple that I want to focus in on. One is effectively connecting with millennial and Gen Z audiences. The second is dollars and cents financial fluency for beverage professionals, which we kind of did on the first podcast that we did. Yep. Let's talk about the first one, effectively connecting with millennials and Gen Z. So I had a lot of people commenting on that to me yesterday. And what's the main message that you want to get across to people around that? So I think what's important to understand is that um, as a generational cohort, the combination of millennial and Gen Z, while they don't represent the largest dollar spends yet, they're, ru they're roughly about 40% of spends in beverage alcohol, they do represent the most significant influence on what is being done and how it's being done. So for anyone that exists in the beverage alcohol space, whether you're a brand or, or an operator, a, a restaurant, a, a retailer, you can't just do things the way you did it for boomers and my generation, Gen X, the, the irrelevant generation. You know, we, we don't have much sway. We're just the coattails of boomers. But the way that millennials and Gen Z engage with products, interact with brands and businesses, what's, what their value set are, what's important to them is so dramatically different. Um, to boomers, they're the, the children of wars. They're the children of inconsistency. So boomers are hyper loyal. They drink that same one. You, you know who I'm talking about, that old couple that's got to be at the same banquet at the same restaurant every Sunday night at 5.30. They've got to get the prime rib and cut. He's got to get the extra sour cream on his baked potato. And they always drink the same, pick one of those five Napa Cabernets that you know they always drink. They need that consistency because they grew up in chaos. Consistency was comfort. Um, millennials and Gen Z, they, uh, they value the inconsistency. For instance, the social media credibility. So if you're a millennial or a Gen Z and you can post on Instagram or TikTok or whatever, look at this grape you've never heard of, this country you've never heard of, this winery you've never heard of. Also, wait till you hear their story mm. about how it's a women owned and minority inclusive and they donate to this charity and all that stuff. The taste is almost the least important thing. Mm -hmm. It's more the story, the ethos, the environmental community consciousness. Also, as generational cohorts, millennials and Gen Z, uh, they really don't prize drinking. In fact, the movement of no and low is because most of them identify that it's status to not drink versus my generation and older, it's status to drink. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's not that they don't drink at all, but it, it's just a, a very different approach to how they interact with brands, with products, with wines, with cocktails, with all of that. Uh, if you look at the explosive growth of RTDs, alternative packaging, single serves, uh, many uh, younger millennials and Gen Z identify that they never spend more than $30 on a bottle of wine and also don't really like the idea if they have to drink five servings. So that the whole idea of single serve or ready mix or uh, low alcohol, that's why, you know, White Claw Truly and Renu and all these spritzy seltzers that are relatively all alcohol have become so popular. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the most amazing research findings at all uh, with my partner, and this is Erica Ducey from yeah. Business of Drinks. Uh, and if you're not listening to that podcast, it's a must. Um, she conducted a year long research study and one of the really interesting things that revealed was that Gen Z, when they go to someone's house for dinner or for a party, the number one thing they bring is soda, like Olipop or like or like better for you beverages that are no alcohol or very low alcohol. Mm. So we as an industry need to recognize that 
showing a, an image of a barrel room and talking about the oak and how many generations of winemaking it is doesn't cut it anymore for this generation. Yeah. And so it's all about engaging with them on their terms and language that they use yeah. and making sure that we are serving them and making their drinking experience open and inclusive. Not like, oh, you, you, you drink seltzers, well, pff, talk to me when you drink for real. Like that's, that, that doesn't cut it. Right. We want to make sure that everyone who is interacting with these people understand how to reach them on their terms in a way that makes it comfortable. I love that. I love that. That's such a, you know, just before you came here, we were actually talking about like the health and wellness space of, of the drinking and like how to combine how many more people are looking at that now, right? It's trying to live a little bit more healthy and taking longer segments throughout the year of not drinking to focus on their productivity and things like this. So actually, I have a follow-up question to that briefly, if you don't mind. Yep. Do you have, have you seen any examples or can you give an example of anybody who's actually implemented a strategy that kind of addresses the issues that you just talked about? Like anybody who's doing it in a good way? Sure. Um, I think Lente is a great example. Lente went through this um, massive shift where the majority of their customers were boomers and older Gen X. And over three years, they made a purposeful shift into trying to target and reach millennial Gen Z audiences. And it would be hours for me to explain what they did and how they did it. Mm -hmm. But in three years, they managed to shift the entire dynamic of their market set. And now Wendy's number one customer is the millennial Gen Z combined cohort. So, but it was purposeful. So their success wasn't like, oh, how do we just want to reach younger audiences? Like, okay, we need to stop doing what we're doing the way we're doing it and reinvent the way we do it. So organic uh, communication. I think uh, I think they 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 did a whole thing, a whole social media series about like just how to be comfortable bringing wine to your friends or something like that, if, if I'm not mistaken. That might have been a different brand. Mm. But it was very much uh, how can we engage this generation on the terms and in the language that they want to speak and understand so that we can enable them to interact with our product and foster the future generation. Yeah. So I, I, I guess the short takeaway is if you're an established brand, your established audience can change, mm -hmm. but you have to want to change it. Yeah. You can't just expect that you're going to do things the same way and you're going to continue to appeal. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Okay, we're going to shift a little bit. I want to address the other seminar that you've been doing, which is dollars and cents, financial fluency for beverage professionals. We addressed this a little bit in the first podcast that you and I did six years ago. Yep. I know this can be like a three part hour long series each, which is insane to try to get. But if there's one thing that you wanted to get across to, you know, people in the beverage and hospitality industry around this seminar, what would, what would it be? So the, the ultimate reason for this is we as an industry do a terrible job of teaching the financial aspects of how to manage beverage. Agreed. We're all about, see this pin? That means I know the grapes of Chateau de Pop and the Grand Cruz of the Cote de and the sub-region of Valentigio. And that's all well and good, but that's useless to me as an operator if you can't understand a cost of goods formula, if your wine list is a document of information, not a sales tool, if you have your sherries and Madeiras in the dessert wine section, by the way, there's no such thing as dessert wines. There's only some sweet wines. When most sherries and Madeiras are not sweet and not appropriate for dessert, so they just die in the back of your list, right? So there are all these things about the, the financial acumen of running a beverage program. In fact, uh, my, my column in Psalm Journal is the business of wine. My column in Tasting Panel is winning at beverage. Mm. And it all focuses on the things that you need to know as an operator that nobody teaches you, that you either flounder like a fish out of water for years and years until you kind of figure it out on your own, or if you're one of the very few lucky people that has a really great mentor that also has the time to teach you how to do these things. So it's all about, I mean, we go through like understanding what EBITDA means, understanding contribution margin, um, uh, sales frequency, blended cost of goods, like the things that people like how to price, uh, how to under, how to account for loss, how to diagnose cost of goods issues, like everything that a beverage program operator at any level, whether this is a winery tasting room, or a 3,000 uh, reference wine list at a Michelin star restaurant or anywhere in between. Anything that someone who's going to run that program needs to know to run it successfully and profitably. Yeah, I love that. Gosh, we need to do a follow-up interview. Whenever you're ready. <laughs> if we need I'm to make here. it happen. I'm here. Lastly, if you could have coffee with anyone in the world, who would it be? You. Let's have some coffee. <laughs> All right, let's do it, man. <laughs> um, I'll say this. Uh, Dave Grohl. I'll, I'll answer the Dave question. Dave Grohl, really. okay. I like this. I have had wine with Dave Grohl. That no man way. is wine knowledgeable, and he's also really funny. Uh, but uh, just 
what he's done, what his career trajectory is, the fact that he's really into wine is kind of cool too. I did not know that. Um, but yeah, he's he's awesome. Also, I love the food burger, so there's yeah, that. Yeah, too. But, uh, but yeah, uh, if you could have coffee with him, he'd probably be like, uh, I'll bring the Hopri on, you bring the espresso. <laughs> That's a good, good combo. Brother, thank you so much, as always, for everything that you do, and I really appreciate your time, dude. Awesome, thank you. Today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thanks, man. Thanks.